<clears throat> Thank you, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be with you all tonight. I see some uh, familiar faces and some uh, well-known names um, and a lot of people that um, uh, are here for the first time. So uh, this is my first podcast. Uh, uh, I'm a person of the 20th century, not the 21st century, and so getting used to some of these uh, newfangled things is a bit of a challenge, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, yeah, just a word about my own interest in the Gospel of John. I uh, grew up in a um, uh, traditional Roman Catholic environment before the Second Vatican Council, uh, when the old Tridentine Mass was being celebrated in Latin. And uh, as an altar boy, I remember the last gospel that was said at every mass, which was the opening of the gospel of John. In principio erat verbum et verbum, erat apodeum, adeus erat verbum, etc. Uh, those poetic lines of the prologue, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later on this evening, um, stuck with me and um, motivated me in many ways to take up uh, what I've done for most of my life, that is uh, study of the New Testament and um, its environment. Um, didn't start out with the Gospel of John, but uh, have wound up uh, during the course of the last 15 or 20 years, spending most of my time focusing on this text. So um, uh, what we'll do during the course of the next six weeks is uh, a little uh, journey through John to borrow from a title of a book that was uh, uh, written by a British New Testament scholar some years ago, uh, looking at some of the highlights and trying to get some feel for the text and uh, its complexity. Um, so uh, that's um, a little bit, just a little bit about me and a little bit about what we're up to. What I'm going to do now is to um, share the screen with you so you're not looking at me and my books all the time um, and uh, have a little bit of a PowerPoint that will walk us through some things. First of all, some general considerations about uh, tackling this text and then uh, introductory issues, um, authorship date, etc. And then uh, a little bit about uh, the prologue and um, what's going on there. So that's our agenda for today. And uh, what I'm going to do now is to get my screen to share. And um, you should all now be seeing a little bit of a PowerPoint. OK. So to begin with, I think it might be uh, worthwhile. I know from some of the names and faces that I see here that there are some theological and biblical veterans. And there are probably some people who are engaging in this, maybe uh, this kind of study um, for the first time or uh, not as frequently as others. So it's useful to think a little bit about um, what's involved in approaching a text like this. And we can come to a, a gospel text or any New Testament text uh, with a number, wearing a number of hats. And some of us uh, tend to um, find that some hats fit better than others. One hat might be that of an historian asking questions about um, what are the sources of this text? Um, gospels, oral tradition, what's its environment? Um, we can ask, um, putting on the historical hat, um, is this text reliable when it talks about Jesus? Is it giving us information that we can't find someplace else? And we can also ask questions about uh, the environment in which it uh, grew and developed and the uh, entities or traditions with which it was in some sort of uh, creative or critical dialogue with the Jewish tradition, with Gnosticism, whatever that is, and we'll perhaps talk about uh, that a little bit more, with philosophy, Greek philosophy in the Roman imperial period, or with Roman imperial political structures. What kind of environment was it in? These are historical questions, and there'll be questions that will no doubt come up. Um, we can approach this text, as uh, many contemporary scholars do, as careful readers of literature. And when we do that, we can ask questions about what kind of story is it? Uh, what kind of points is it driving home? What's its narrative rhetoric? Um, does it have a plot? Uh, how does it portray characters? These are typical uh, traditional questions that a literary critic will ask. And are there other literary features that are worth noting? And there are, and we'll definitely note some of them. Um, we can approach this text too as Christian believers or non-believers for that matter. Uh, if, if we do so as believers, we might ask, um, uh, what does this text mean for our faith in God and Christ and his church? Um, does its content help? Or does it sometimes um, hinder perhaps um, our own approach to faith? Does it have a dark side, particularly in its portrait of the Jews? Something that a lot of people have worried about in the post-Holocaust period. Uh, 
So uh, I ask you, um, as you engage in this, this study, to think a little bit about what your own uh, approach uh, consists of. What, uh, what questions most intrigue you? And what, um, uh, what ways would you like to see the text analyzed? We'll be doing a little bit of all of the above, but um, uh, you can ask your own questions and pursue uh, some of your interests in some of the readings that I'll be sending you away. So let's um, think first about uh, some introductory uh, issues, the standard sorts of things that uh, one worries about in approaching a biblical text. Who was it written by? Um, tradition attributes it to John, uh, the son of Zebedee, uh, one of the first five disciples that um, Jesus called, according to the accounts in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John, uh, all up there in the Sea of Galilee. Um, this John, son of Zebedee, or who, who, whoever it is, uh, the tradition says it's John, the son of Zebedee, is usually identified as the character who appears in the text as the beloved disciple. And he appears at several places at the Last Supper, uh, lying beside Jesus. That's the way people dined in those days. He's there at the cross and assumes responsibility for or is taken under the wing of the mother of Jesus exactly what the relationship there is. We could worry about a little bit, but there's some new family being created. He's there at the tomb where he has a little road race with uh, Peter, beats Peter uh, to the tomb, but lets uh, Peter in first. Peter goes away scratching his head. The beloved disciple believes. That says something about him, doesn't it? What does he believe? Question some people ask. And he's there too at the uh, appearance of Jesus at Galilee, the uh, the fish fry in uh, John 21. Uh, he may be, some people suspect, um, that he is uh, there as the other disciple who pops up in chapter 18 at the house of the high priest and is therefore known to the high priest. Mm, not entirely clear. All of the other indications, all the other places refer to him as the disciple that Jesus loved. So we have this character in the text that tradition identifies in a certain way. Is that tradition something that we can um, affirm? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it would appear that the beloved disciple who's in the text as a character and who emerges in the tradition of reading the text as the author was a real human being who died. And one of the things that's uh, discussed in John 21 is, uh, did Jesus predict that he'd come back before this uh, beloved disciple died? And if he died, did that uh, undercut that promise? Uh, what's in behind that is probably um, a saying of Jesus that we encounter in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. There are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of heaven coming in glory. So hmm, was that something applied to a particular individual? And if so, who was it? Was it John the son of Zebedee? Maybe. Or maybe it was someone else with the same name. We know of a fellow named the elder or presbyter John. Um, Eusebius, the church historian of the fourth century, talks about him and refers to sources that mention him uh, from the second century. And a number of contemporary scholars say, well, maybe it's John, um, the elder who is really responsible for the fourth gospel. And that's how we um, uh, get the name John associated with the text. Um, I'm not sure if we can ever discover who the real author was, but I think we can note something of the function of the author figure in the text. And the fact that the author is decidedly anonymous, I think plays a role. Um, there are two main functions I think that the uh, author serves. One is um, to invite the reader into the text. Um, don't you, as a reader, if you're responding positively to what's in the text, want to be there at the side of Jesus at his supper? Don't you want to be there at the cross? Don't you want to be there at the resurrection and um, uh, with him in his resurrected life? Yeah, uh, you might want to identify with the character in the text. And we know from ancient uh, theoreticians like Aristotle that um, it was assumed that people would identify with uh, a character, usually the protagonist, in a work of drama, for instance. Can't quite do that with the protagonist here since he has a very special relationship with God, but you might be able to identify with someone else. So perhaps that's what this figure is doing. But I think the figure is doing something else. The figure is clearly identified within the text 
as an eyewitness, as someone who bears testimony, reliable testimony to Jesus, who he is and what he means. Um, but generally, when you, in a legal document or in any other circumstance where there's someone bearing testimony and giving witness, you'll want to know who that person is. And I think uh, one of the things that the anonymity of the beloved disciple does is to invite you to go searching for who that witness is. And this is not speculation, it's a matter of fact. For the last 2,000 years, people have been searching for the identity of the beloved disciple. There was a um, book done a couple of years ago by a colleague at Princeton, Jim Charlesworth, a very well-known New Testament scholar, which I happened to see at um, a Society of Biblical Literature meeting at one of the book desks, picked it up, looked it over, saw what the thesis was, um, check to see if he was citing any of my uh, work, you know, the usual vanity thing, um, and knew right away um, that he had it wrong because he wanted to identify the beloved disciple he knew who it was. He, he gave you all the history of uh, the search for the beloved disciple, so you see that, in fact, it did bring people back into the text time and time again. He came up with the notion that it was Thomas, and I knew right away it couldn't be. Why? because the beloved disciple believes in chapter 20 and Thomas is still doubting at the end of the chapter. So in any case, uh, we had a conversation about that and he came up with another explanation. Point here, uh, the character of the beloved disciple within the text points to someone outside of the text, but more importantly, it invites readers into the text. And that I think is uh, one of the main inferences we can make about uh, who the author is. In any case, tradition, uh, paints a picture of um, uh, John, the beloved disciple, in all sorts of ways. Here you have Donatello's statue and the painting by Bosch. It's also assumed, by the way, that this is the John who names himself as the author of the book of Revelation. Uh, and uh, he's often pictured as he is in the picture to the right by Bosch on Patmos, receiving a revelation. Um, pictured um, often as in the... Um, uh, Donatello statue and here in this um, uh, later uh, bit of artwork as an author and he very much he or they we might want to worry about our pronouns here there may be more than one person involved in the creation of this text that they have literary skill that is for sure and they're also looking on high as the picture on the right suggests um, El Greco's uh, picture brings in the uh, elements of the apocalypse and also the, uh, the prediction that um, uh, poison will not harm uh, that we get at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Um, and um, uh, is there poison? Well, that's something we'll have to worry about a little bit. So written by someone um, who is a very clever author uh, or some ones who are very clever authors, but when? Um, probably late first or early second century. And that's the general consensus. And I think that's right. There were some people that want to date the gospel a little earlier, some people a little later. But the main facts are that um, it seems to know the synoptic gospels. Now, exactly how it knows the synoptic gospels is a matter of some debate. And whether it was uh, developed uh, at the same time that the synoptic gospels were being written and therefore has some sort of uh, interaction with them at different stages, possible. But I think at the end of the day, uh, the uh, Gospel of John knows the Gospel of Mark and knows the Gospel of Luke, maybe even knows the Gospel of Matthew and uses elements from them in very creative ways. If that is correct, and since I'm saying it, it must be right. If that's correct, then um, the Gospel is probably later than 90. Uh, which is probably 1995 uh, when um, the Gospel of Luke uh, was probably written. Mark written about 70, Matthew 80s, Luke in the 90s. Um, but can we have a terminus ante, a date before which the Gospel was written? Uh, some people have argued uh, in the past, that there's a little papyrus fragment um, in Manchester, England, uh, the John Ryland's library, P52 it's called, um, that has a little bit of text from John 18, and that that gives us a, a terminus ante, a date before which the gospel was written. 
Uh, why? Because the original editors of the text said, oh, this looks like, like papyri that we're familiar with from around 125 to 150. So that's when we're going to date it. This is a very technical bit of business, papyrological dating of um, uh, manuscripts. And uh, contemporary experts in the field say, nah, it's not quite so certain. It could be as late as the late second or third century. So that doesn't provide a really firm um, terminus ante. Irenaeus, uh, the famous uh, heresiologist who wrote against the Gnostics around 180, uh, explicitly cites the gospel and makes a big deal of it. So we know that by that time in the Latin church uh, of the West, uh, but also written by someone who was a member of um, uh, the church in the East in Smyrna. Uh, Irenaeus uh, knows this gospel and reveres it. And there's other evidence uh, from that period that is known or revered in the circles that um, Irenaeus was criticizing, the Gnostics. Um, there are lots of things that sound like echoes of the gospel in earlier second century literature, uh, but are they echoes of the gospel? They're not citations. Uh, they're not exact words from uh, a, a particular and, un, uh, and obviously recognizable source within the gospel. They're themes for the most part. Um, uh, well, that's debated, but in any case, they're not citations. Uh, these uh, start appearing as early as around 110 with the letters of Ignatius of Antioch, and maybe even in Justin Martyr, although not quite so clearly by the middle of the century. So there are a number of things that uh, suggest that the gospel is around and in circulation by um, the second quarter of the second century at least, and that again pushes it to the late first or early second. And that's when I, like most people, tend to date it. Uh, I've alluded to the, uh, the fact a couple of times now that um, there may be complexity in the way this uh, gospel develops or the way it was composed. Uh, there are some things that are pretty obvious. There is the, um, the business of uh, chapter 21, which is uh, an epilogue. Um, uh, what do we mean by an epilogue? It, uh, the gospel seems to end nicely at the end of chapter 20, but there's more to be said. And the more that's uh, said has something to do with the status of Peter and it also has something to do with the apparent death of the person identified in some minds as the beloved disciple. So that may be uh, subsequent to the composition of the gospel, um, maybe by the same hand, we don't know, or the same hands, but in any case, it seems to be uh, an, an additional element. There's also a famous story uh, that appears in uh, the end of chapter seven through uh, chapter eight, 11, uh, the story of the adulteress, the woman brought to um, Jesus uh, accused of having committed adultery. And Jesus um, uh, famously bends over, kneels down, writes something in the sand. And the people who are accusing her and wanting her to be stoned come and look at whatever he has to say. What did he say? Doesn't say, doesn't tell us. Lots of speculation on that. In any case, they go away, the accusers do. And Jesus uh, tells the woman to sin no more. Uh, famous story, very popular, a uh, big book done on it just recently and on the uh, way in which it um, uh, shaped and was used in the history of the church, but it's clearly secondary. Uh, there are elements in it that uh, seem to be more Lucan than Johannine, borderline cases there, but in any case, there's that. And that's the major fact that a lot of people in antiquity, church fathers citing the gospel say, well, the manuscripts that we have, this isn't there. And it appears in several places in different manuscripts. So it looks like it was an addition, an addition to the text um, after it had uh, achieved widespread circulation. So there were these elements that suggest um, uh, later development of the text, but there are also things within the text that suggest that it developed over time. Interconnections like uh, the uh, business in chapter seven that provides um, uh, a kind of halakhic response to the accusation that um, Jesus was breaking the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath, which took place in chapter five. Uh, so it looks as if um, there was a source that had a healing on the Sabbath story with a defense, that, the like of which we find in the Synoptic Gospels, that someone pulled apart and used the elements of which in two different places. That happens a lot 
uh, with uh, th parallels to uh, gospel materials in the Gospel of John. Elements are taken apart and reused in different contexts. Gives us something of the sense of the way in which this text developed. Um, some other things that uh, point to development. Um, the end of chapter 10 naturally connects with the end of chapter 11 and the whole business about the resurrection of Lazarus and the encounter with Mary and Martha looks as if it was an inserted into a story about Jesus coming uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem, um, it, suggesting that uh, you know, there was a process of, of uh, editorial expansion at some point. Uh, was it editorial expansion or was it uh, composition? In any case, uh, development. And then um, in the uh, farewell discourse after Jesus has washed the feet of the disciples and uh, sent uh, Judas on his way, uh, he's uh, going off um, uh, before he goes off to uh, the garden. Um, he gives a long speech or a set of speeches. It seems to come in several parts. And at one point in chapter, the end of chapter 14, he says, let's get up and go. Uh, you'd think the next thing would be the scene in the garden. But no, there are a couple more chapters of discourse suggesting that there was a layering, a development of this text. So how do we explain this? Different sources being used? Yeah, that's a possibility. And there are elaborate theories about what the sources of the Gospel of John are. We're not going to spend an awful lot of time on that unless uh, someone has some questions. Is it the case that there were several editions of this text? Well, maybe, but what does it mean to have an edition in the first century? This is pre-print culture and books circulated and were developed and grown uh, in various ways. Uh, and we see this in lots of more popular literature in the, in the period. Um, is it the case that we have later editions? I think that's certainly the case with the uh, pericope of the adulteress. Uh, but I think a lot of the stuff in the text that shows development is probably the work of a, an, uh, an editor or an editorial team that's using this text for religious instruction purposes and using it and developing it as it um, as it gets used. So um, what I want to think about now is the text as a whole um, and think about its literary character, putting on that literary hat that we talked about in the, uh, the first slide. Uh, and this is a, an approach that um, is pretty common these days in a lot of Johannine circles. It used to be the case that a lot of people were pursuing the issue of uh, what the sources were and what the process of development was. Now, a lot of people say, no, let's just sit back and take the text as a whole and see how it works, okay? And if we do, um, we see some things that are pretty obvious. It has two big parts, uh, what's usually called the Book of Signs, the first 12 chapters, where Jesus does a number of miraculous deeds, which are called signs. What does it mean to be a sign? Uh, people see signs and they don't get the meaning. What is it? What are they getting about the, the sign? Is a sign simply another word for miracle or is it some code word for uh, a trigger for deeper reflection? I think it's the latter and I think John wants you to get to think about it. In any case, the second half of the, uh, the book is uh, called the Book of Glory. Why? Because the gospel talks about the hour of Jesus is the hour of his glorification. And um, glorification might be construed as his return to the Father. But there's a focus on the cross as the point where glorification happens. And that is certainly ironic, isn't it? Uh, glory in a bleeding, dying body. Um, the Gospel of John, thinking about its language, is generally very simple prose. Uh, none of the rhetorical complexity uh, that we get in something like the Epistle of the Hebrews or some Pauline letters. Uh, nothing like the, um, the, the narrative and rhetorical skill that we get in a lot of portions of uh, the Gospel of Luke or the Book of Acts. You know, it's much simpler in many ways. Um, uh, but um, that simplicity uh, cloaks some real complexity. And the complexity um, is conveyed through the dramatic characters and their interactions and through lengthy discourses of Jesus that um, call upon a number of different uh, things, highly symbolic language in most of these discourses, um, light, bread of life, good shepherd, the vine, et cetera. We'll talk about some of these beginning tonight and certainly in the rest of our, our conversations. Um, and the dramatic encounters between Jesus and other people are, 
a very uh, striking feature of this gospel with Nicodemus. Um, and in each of these dramatic encounters, there's irony, certainly in that case, where Nicodemus doesn't get what Jesus is talking about, but we do, the classic case of dramatic irony. Or Caiaphas, who says things like, it's better to have one die than the nation to be destroyed. A very cynical kind of remark, which is also profound theology. Uh, irony is an important part of what, um, what the gospel is about. And one other thing about the gospel that um, uh, many people note is that it, it has kind of riddling quality. And people wonder, uh, why does it riddle so? Is it, is it because someone uh, or some group put it together over time and stuck pieces together in ways that don't really fit? And therefore, uh, it's kind of faulty composition and uh, riddles because they didn't give it enough thought? Or is it the case that um, riddles are intentional and are designed to get you to think about some particular issues that the author wants you to author or authors wants to uh, get you to think about. I tend to think it's the latter, um, but that that's something to worry about. Okay. Oops, we need to move along. Yeah. So the gospel definitely has distinctive features: a chronology of the life of Jesus, which is longer than what we get in the synoptics. A length of about two to three years with um, extending over three Passovers uh, and the placement of the temple incident, Jesus driving out the, uh, the merchants in the temple early in Jesus' career in chapter two here of John, whereas in the synoptic gospels, it comes at the end. Um, the presentation of Jesus and the assessment of Jesus is definitely distinctive. The Christology, as theologians tend to describe it, is a high one. Jesus is, as one uh, scholar working on the gospel said, uh, a God walking on earth. Um, and this Christology is reflected in the lengthy discourses that Jesus uh, gets into. We talked about that just a moment ago, which contrasts very sharply with the witty parables and sayings that we get uh, on his lips in the synoptic gospels. Um, there's a notion of salvation in this text and a process of salvation that focuses very heavily on recognizing the truth, on that is revelation. Is this, as some people have suspected, uh, uh, part of an engagement of the author or authors with the Gnostic tradition, with that tradition of early Christianity that worried about knowledge as the key to um, uh, salvation? Uh, possibly. We'll have to think a little bit more about that. Um, and another distinctive feature is the relationship of this gospel to uh, the history and uh, traditions of Israel. In some ways, this is uh, the most Jewish of our gospels. It embeds Jesus in um, Jewish tradition, in, in uh, the temple, in the um, festival cycle, uh, and the symbolism that derives from uh, that tradition in a very significant way. But at the same time, there's a strong polemic against the Jews. What do we make of that? And uh, how do we understand that, both in historical terms and also in contemporary theological terms? So um, that's uh, enough for, for starters to get a little bit of a framework for the, uh, the whole of the gospel. And in the next couple of minutes, um, uh, I'm not going to keep you all night here, but we have about um, uh, another 10 to 15 minutes to think about the prologue, and then we'll open it up for some questions and see what, uh, what's on your mind. Uh, the prologue uh, consists of um, uh, bits of poetry interwoven with prose, and I put poetry in scare quotes here. Uh, what we're talking about is balanced cadence prose, very much what we get in um, traditional Israelite literature, either the Psalms or also Proverbs and the like, uh, which contrasts with prosaic, uh, not so neatly balanced uh, material, usually referring to John the Baptist in verses six through eight, poetry again in verses nine through 14, and again, John the Baptist in verse 15, and then poetry concluding. So this, is, uh, this uh, literary quality of the prologue has led many people to think, who maybe there was a hymn that was in circulation before this gospel was written. And the author or authors of this text said, ooh, this might make a good way of beginning the gospel. I can adapt it and uh, use it for my prologue. Entirely possible. 
although we can't prove it, we don't have uh, evidence outside of the gospel for it. Uh, what does this prologue do? It functions uh, like what the ancients called a hypothesis, uh, something that um, hangs in the front of a drama or uh, what might uh, appear in the preface to a, a prosaic work. The summary of the plot before it begins. Uh, and that's what we have here in some ways. And it shapes the reading of the narrative. It highlights certain things that uh, are going to be important as the uh, narrative or the drama, however we want to describe it, uh, uh, moves along. Uh, and what the prologue does is to focus on the transformative result of encounter with Jesus. And I think that's very important because that I think is what the gospel is trying to do trying to get people to have a transformative encounter with Jesus as remembered in the tradition. And that's why the author has to reshape the tradition. There's something familiar that people have because they've read the gospels or heard stories about Jesus, but he wants to say, just move beyond what you've heard and have a new encounter with Jesus. Right. So what are the claims that are laid out in the prologue? Um, that there's a connection between Jesus and God from the beginning, NRK, um, language that uh, echoes the beginning of the, uh, the book of Genesis in the uh, Greek translation. Um, and in the beginning was the word, and this word was with God, and this word was, was God. So there's a very intimate connection between whatever it is that we encounter in Jesus and whatever it is, it's ultimate in uh, existence. Um, this um, the word that becomes available to us in this person of Jesus is transformative. It gave people the power to become children of God. Uh, this is something that's going to be illustrated in a particular way in that Nicodemus story, but it's also, I think, part of all of the encounters that we have in the Gospel of John and all of the encounter that the Gospel of John is trying to affect with its readers, becoming children of God. And what does it mean to become a child of God? Well, we'll have to worry about that. Um, the other striking thing, or one of the striking things about the prologue is the word becoming flesh, pitching its tent uh, among us. The skenos is the Greek word, to pitch the tent. The word became flesh and how fleshy uh, is the word, and how important is it that the word is flesh? And then the contrast, contrast between Jesus and Moses. Uh, Moses um, brought grace, uh, brought uh, uh, beauty and truth. Jesus brings something more. Right? What is it that's involved in this contrast? Uh, there are a number of themes in addition to these main points that I think are part of the, uh, the main rhetorical thrust of the whole of the gospel. There are themes that run through the text. And uh, whether this text was composed as a prologue or adapted as a prologue, uh, the connection between these themes and what happens in the text is extremely important. One uh, was uh, the connection of the word and light. And yes, we have uh, light being uh, referred to in chapter three after the um, Nicodemus episode. We have Jesus identifying himself as the light of the world in chapter eight in the context of the Tabernacles Festival. Uh, we have a healing of a man born blind where he is enlightened. And there's clearly a play on that notion. Um, we have Jesus talking about walking in the light of the day sounding a theme that uh, appears in some synoptic sayings of Jesus, but here adapted in a new and intriguing way and encouraging people to walk in the light. All of this, by the way, coming up in the first half of the gospel, the book of signs. Um, Jesus referring to himself as the one who has come as the light, part of the summary of the whole uh, first 12 chapters. After that, where is the light? Ain't there because after chapter 13, verse 30, it was night. But remember what the prologue says, the night, the light shone in the darkness and the darkness did not grasp it. So there's a reference, I think, to the way in which the whole of the gospel is structured in the way in which the light motif, no pun intended, is uh, deployed in the prologue. 
uh, life is also something that is in the word, in the Logos. And this is eternal life is the usual way it's referred to in the fourth gospel, as opposed to the kingdom of God language, which pops up a lot in the synoptic gospels and only briefly in the fourth gospel. Life, in any case, life eternal comes from belief. It's associated with water. Hmm. Uh, in the uh, Samaritan woman story, uh, life uh, is connected with resurrection on the last day. There's a future resurrection that uh, is part of the, the fabric of the gospel, as well as a metaphorical resurrection in the here and now. Life is something that comes with the bread that Jesus gives to eat. Is this a sacramental reference or is it a, some sort of metaphorical reference? We'll have to worry about that. Jesus is part of his mission was to, to bring uh, life. He came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, and Jesus identifies himself as the resurrection and the life in chapter 11. Identifies himself as the way, the truth, and the life in chapter 14. And in his final prayer, uh, talks about the, the life that the Father has given. So this too is a key motif throughout the whole of the text. And it ends, the text ends with the, the promise of life eternal coming from belief. So uh, why this repeats, I don't know. In any case, the prologue also highlights conflict, conflict that we already alluded to, conflict with the world that did not know the Logos, conflict with his own that received him not, the Jews, and uh, highlights the difference with Moses. The law came through Moses, grace and truth through Christ. So conflict is part of it, and conflict is going to be part of what the narrative is uh, engaged in at some level. There's also uh, a few things that aren't explicitly referred to in the same way that light and life and uh, the like are referred to. Uh, the identification of the Logos and the, uh, as Jesus as the Logos is implicit throughout the text, but not continued in the way that these other motifs are. Uh, that Jesus is somehow one with God is affirmed, but in a riddling way. Uh, first of all, in chapter 10, verse 30, that he and the father are one, but the father is greater than he in chapter 14. And then he's recognized as God, Lord and God, by doubting Thomas at the end. What are we to make of this claim? And then the business of being born again, born from God, uh, is prominent in one chapter, but not explicit in the others. Why is that? We can worry about that, and we will have to do so in due course. Okay, I'm piling on a lot here, but I'm gonna give you just a little bit more before we open it up for questions. The background of the identification of Jesus as the word. Um, two important things. One is the tradition of the Shekinah or the glorious divine presence of God, which is first reported on Mount Sinai where the glory of God settled. Um, and where Moses entered and saw that glory entering into the cloud. That glorious presence also dwells, uh, the Hebrew word is shaken, um, dwells in the tabernacle, uh, instructions for which are given in Exodus 25, uh, or in Deuteronomy, where the name of God dwells, in the tabernacle that is. So either God's glorious presence or his name dwell, pitch their tent in uh, some significant way uh, in uh, the, the place of worship. And uh, all of these motifs are woven together in the way in which um, uh, Jesus is presented in John. Uh, Jesus is also the divine name. We'll think about that when we come to uh, look at chapter eight. And uh, the divine dwells in him in some significant way. Later Jewish Targums, the Aramaic translations of the Old Testament use the term extensively for talking about the divine presence. So we know that thinking about the Shekinah, the divine presence of God is something that was there in Jewish tradition roughly at the time that uh, this gospel was written. Um, the other important strand coming out of Judaism that um, goes into this notion of the word uh, with whom Jesus is identified comes from the wisdom tradition beginning in Proverbs chapter eight, uh, where wisdom is a presence with God from the, from the beginning. 
uh, in Ben Sira, written in the second century BC, where wisdom is identified with the Torah and it pitches its tent in Israel and provides satisfying food and drink. Uh, all of these things are what is said about uh, Jesus in uh, the fourth gospel. That's what's being drawn upon by calling Jesus the word. And it's also there in the wisdom of Solomon, a uh, sapiential text written probably around the end of the first century BC, which brings in yet another element, the element from the Greek philosophical tradition that identifies um, this word, this wisdom as a pneuma, a spirit that enters into the souls of um, men in every generations, men and women, I should say men and women in every generations, making them friends of God and prophets. Um, that tradition is lurking in the background and is brought to the table by a Jewish philosopher, Philo of Alexandria, living from around uh, 30 BC to around 45 CE, who tried to synthesize his reading of Greek philosophy, both Plato and the Stoa, and the wisdom tradition and the Torah. Uh, he has the notion that um, the, the creator God look to ideas. This is what we have in Plato's Timaeus. Um, what he does, what Plato, what Philo does is to say, ah, what he looked to were the ideas in his own head, not something beyond him, not some realm of ideas or forms that he did not create. And he expressed those thoughts, this, these ideas that he had as that spirit, that force that pervades all things that the wisdom of Solomon talks about, and that provides uh, the possibility of relationship to God. Um, Philo called this divine presence, his understanding of the Shekinah, the Logos, the word. And I think that's what's uh, behind uh, what's going on here in the fourth gospel. Uh, some connection with Philonic notions. Uh, the notion of the Logos plays an important role in Christian theology hereafter, uh, and a distinction made in Philo between the word in the head and the word on the tongue uh, comes to be used of the incarnation of Christ in the second century, and that, of course, leads to difficulties um, that lead to the Nicene um, solution, the Arian controversy and the Nicene solution. Because if you posit a change between two stages of the word, are you saying that there is change in a divine element, a divine person? If so, can that divine person be fully God? And Arius said, no, he can't. He can be godlike, but not God. So uh, this is going to have a history in uh, Christian theology, and um, that would be yet another uh, course to take. Uh, what we need to know now is that like many early Christians, John is affirming Jesus as somehow involved in creation and also most importantly involved in the revelation of who God is and what, uh, what it means to be in relationship with God. Um, and that is um, intimately connected with his incarnate nature. And that is something we'll have to think about. All right, so uh, I'm going to stop sharing. That's uh, what I wanted to give you today as a bit of background in terms of um, some general introductory material and a reading of the prologue pointing us uh, ahead to what we're going to be engaged in in um, the next five weeks.